Berry Conservation District is your local resource for all things natural resources. The district is here to help you manage your natural resources responsibly for present and future generations. The district works with landowners and community groups to provide resource conservation assistance. So you've heard about native plants, but maybe you're not sure exactly what all the buzz is about or how to get started. We can help. In this video, we will talk about what native plants are and their benefits. Then we will go into detail about how to choose which species to use for natural lakeshore plantings. The resources we will highlight can also be used for other native plantings like rain gardens, pollinator gardens, wildlife habitat, and even landscaping. We'll show you some quick tricks on how to pick out which native plants to use, where you can buy them, and even how to find contractors to help you with the work. To start, let's talk about what native plants are and the benefits to using them. Native plants are those that occur naturally in a region in which they evolved, rather than having been brought over by humans. Most ornamental plants that you buy at a traditional nursery or hardware store are not native and were probably cultivated from plants coming from other temperate climates like countries in Europe or Asia. So why does that matter and what benefits do native plants have? Plants make great wildlife habitat by providing food and shelter. Native plants are better for wildlife from the tiniest of insects to the largest of mammals. For example, research by the entomologist Doug Tallamy has shown that native oak trees support over 500 species of caterpillars, whereas ginkgos, a commonly planted landscape tree from Asia, hosts only five species of caterpillars. Greater insect diversity supports greater insectivore, like birds, diversity, and so on up the food chain. In short, native plant diversity supports native wildlife diversity. Native plants are lower maintenance. When planted in the appropriate spot, native plants require no fertilizers and less watering and maintenance over the years compared to ornamental plants. Michigan native plants were built Michigan tough. Native plants are more likely to withstand our wide range of extreme weather conditions. They're also more resistant to local pests and many have evolved to have chemical or other defenses against our native insects. Whereas the grass used in lawns and many ornamental plants have very shallow roots, native plants however have impressively deep root structures that help both reduce erosion and increase the soil's water storage capacity. More native plants means less mowing, which not only saves time and money, but also helps cut down on carbon dioxide emissions. It also means that there's more above ground plant matter left to store carbon. Native plants are beautiful and come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. So you're sure to find some that you love. Before choosing what native plants to use, you should know the soil texture, soil moisture, and sunlight availability in your planting area. Your project area can have spots with different soil textures, soil moisture levels, and sun availability. When you're looking at each spot you wanna pick out plants for, investigate each one separately to see what the specific combinations of these factors are, and there are sure to be plants that work within that specific combination. So you might have some plants you want to put in the shady, wet, low spot in your yard and others you'd want to put in the sandy, music, full sun spot. We'll talk about what those terms mean. Soil texture is determined by the ratio of different size mineral particles in your soil. Soil texture greatly impacts how water moves and therefore how much of it can or cannot be stored in the soil. Soil texture along with soil pH can also affect nutrient availability. Sand is the largest particle type. This creates large spaces in between particles. These large spaces mean water soaks in quickly, but it also means that it is easily drained and doesn't hold onto that water for very long. Silt is the second largest particle. It is in between sand and clay as far as how quickly water is absorbed and how long it is retained. 
Silt is often found in river or lake beds, but should not be confused with muck, which is a soil type made up primarily of organic materials like decaying plants, whereas silt is a texture or size of mineral particle found in soil. And clay is the smallest. With very small spaces between particles, it holds water longer and it is slower to take up that water. But all of the small spaces combined allow clay to hold more water than the same amount of sand could. Oftentimes, clay soils will remain saturated with water between rain events. Fun fact, loam is a soil type that has a well-balanced mix of sand, silt, and clay. It is known for being the most productive of the soil types because it holds water and nutrients well without being too saturated for crops or other plants to grow. You can use this soil texture calculator to find your soil type based on the ratio of the particles you found in your soil. And are you unsure of your soil texture? You can look it up on the NRCS Web Soil Survey. Also, if you would like a more detailed assessment of your soil, you can purchase a soil test kit through MSU Extension. Soil moisture. You want to have a basic idea of whether your soil is wet, music, or dry. While soil moisture is influenced by soil texture, it is also affected by other factors such as climate, topography, elevation, slope, aspect, soil properties, vegetation types, and vegetation age. For example, loam on top of a hill is going to be naturally drier than loam at the bottom of a low spot, even though they are the same soil texture. Wet soils, also known as hydric, are those typically found in a wetland or shoreline. Wet soils are usually saturated with water and can flood on occasion. Muck is how we refer to wetland soils of this type, which have a high amount of well-degraded organic material. Mesic soils are in between wet and dry. They have a moderate amount of moisture throughout the year, but are well-drained and are not usually fully saturated with water. Dry soils, also known as xeric, are very well-drained and hold little moisture at most times. In Berry County, these tend to be the sandiest of our soils. You can have wet mesic soils, which are in between wet and mesic, and also dry mesic soils, which are between dry and mesic. Finally, you will want to know whether your site is full sun, partial shade, or full shade. Full sun means an area receives 80% or more direct sunlight throughout the day. Partial shade or partial sun means an area gets 30 to 80% direct sunlight throughout the day. This would be like the edge of a woodlot or near some sparse shrubs and full shade means an area gets less than 30% direct sunlight throughout the day. This would be like an area right up next to a large building or under a dense forest canopy. When selecting native plants for a natural shoreline, we need to make sure we're taking into consideration where we'd like to put the plants. There are four zones of a natural shoreline, the upland zone, the buffer zone, the shoreline zone, and the lake zone. Some plants may be suited for use in multiple zones, which is great since it creates a gradual transition among the zones. Now that you know the main factors needed to choose native plants, let's highlight some native plants that are particularly great for these four zones. Let's start in the water and work our way upland toward our houses. In the lake zone, we find vegetation that likes to have its feet wet all the time. Plants in this zone can handle a little fluctuation in the water, but they need to be in standing water most of the time. For our first plant, we have Arrow Arum. This plant looks tropical with its large arrowhead leaves, but it's actually native. 
Greenish white flowers appear in late spring, later forming green seed pods that ripen to shiny metallic green seeds. The seed ball splits open in fall and seeds will float on the water and are very attractive to waterfowl, a favorite of wood ducks and teal. It grows in full or partial sun from shallow water. And as a note, we've included the scientific names for these plants because they can be found under different common names at times. Also, some native plants that have been bred with ornamental plants to increase certain characteristics. These native R's don't have all the benefits of native plants. It's important to know you really are getting a native species when you're trying to provide wildlife habitat and trying to prevent ornamental plants from escaping the garden and becoming invasive in our forests and prairies. Next up, pickerel weed. Shiny green lance-shaped leaves appear from below the water in the spring and can reach up to three feet. Several weeks later, purple flower spikes of numerous tubular flowers bloom. While individual flowers last only a day, the plant can rebloom from spring to fall. The submerged vegetation, like all aquatic plants, provides habitat for micro and macro invertebrates, which are food for fish, amphibians, reptiles, and ducks. The flowers attract many butterflies and the seeds are great food for ducks. This plant spreads so you want to place them four foot apart and they will grow a nice stand after several years. Dark green bulrush. These plants thrive in full sun and can handle up to one foot of standing water. They grow with rhizomes and fibrous roots, meaning they are great at stabilizing soil and preventing erosion. Many stems grow from one rootstock and the plant can spread by seeds or rhizomes. Leaves are grass-like but broad. The flowering heads contain many interesting spikelets that are crowded into dense spherical heads that jut out in many different directions. They develop in May to June. The seeds are good food for ducks, rails, and other wetland birds. Now for the shoreline zone. These plants thrive in moist soil and are tolerant of being in the water for shorter periods, but can't survive in constant standing water. There are many great plant species that enjoy this zone, and this shoreline area can be very important for food or shelter for wildlife species. Cardinal flower. This flower prefers some shade, but can tolerate full sun if sufficient moisture is present. It thrives in wet, rich, moist soil, short-lived, but will self-sow if the flowers get pollinated and produce seed. Each fiery red flower has three spreading lower petals and two upper petals connected to a tubular base. This makes it hard for some common pollinators to access the flower, but ruby-throating hummingbirds and swallowtail and sulfur butterflies do pollinate it easily. The flowers come on in summer and last four to six weeks ending in early fall. Great blue lobelia. This plant is very similar to cardinal flower with toothed lance-shaped leaves and many tubular flowers along an erect stem, but instead the flowers are lavender blue and larger. These flowers bloom in the fall, some lasting until October, and although short-lived, it can self-seed and grow itself into clumps of many plants. It can handle full sun and partial shade, it likes medium soil moisture and tolerates drier soils than the cardinal flower. The blooms are irresistible to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Swamp aster. Beautiful fall blooming aster species, small abundant flowers with light violet blue to purple rays and yellow orange centers. Glossy lance shaped leaves bush out from the stem. Flowers bloom through fall and are important nectar sources and late season pollen for bees, butterflies, and skippers. It's similar to New England aster, but with slightly smaller flower heads and fewer widely spaced ray flowers with smooth, glossy foliage. Also, swamp aster prefers at least partial shade and wants the soil to be wet. It can hug the edges of water bodies easily. Buttonbush, a spreading shrub or small tree 
with many often crooked or leaning branches found in partial shade to full shade and in standing water to medium moist soils. The leaves do not emerge until late spring. In early summer, very interesting creamy white globe flowers resembling pin cushions bloom. These long lasting flowers are extremely attractive to pollinators and butterflies. The button like balls of nut like seeds form in fall and are eaten by ducks, other water birds, and shorebirds, and they persist into the winter. Waterfowl and many other types of birds also use the shrub as nesting habitat. Michigan holly, a medium sized shrub, this holly, unlike other hollies, does not have sharp toothed leaves and does not stay evergreen. The purple green foliage turns yellow in fall and then black and falls off after the first frost. Of note, the shrubs are either male or female, typical of the holly family. The inconspicuous flowers give way to extremely showy dense clusters of bright red berries that ripen in September. The berries can remain on the branches into January if not eaten by birds that are readily attracted to them. A very versatile plant, it can be grown in wet to dry locations in full sun to full shade. This plant is host to the pawpaw sphinx moth. Fox sedge. Fine textured mounds of fountain foliage form small attractive colonies from underground rhizome. The narrow, soft, grass-like leaves are wonderfully evergreen. Moist soil is preferred, but plants will tolerate less soil moisture and can be used to hold soil on shorelines with varying water levels. Plants prosper best in full sun and are pest resistant. They provide habitat and cover for birds while also serving as a host plant for skipper butterflies. Tussock sedge. This sedge does best in full sun and can handle standing water to wet mucky soil. So it would be best on a low bank area. It forms numerous fountain like tussocks or mounds of leafy bright green grass like leaves. In spring, erect flower stalks grow that eventually mature into spiky chocolate brown seed clusters that birds and turtles enjoy seeds from. A great host plant for caterpillars of many species of butterflies and several species of skippers and moths. Dense colonies provide excellent cover for birds and other wildlife. As we move into the buffer zone, we now have plants that thrive in mesic soils and can tolerate runoff moving across the yard when it rains, they will help soak up that water before it rushes into the lake, but they can't survive being constantly underwater. Many of the forbs, trees, and shrubs in this group would be happy to be planted in more upland areas as well. So if you want to extend the plants from your buffer zone further towards the upland, you can blend these in with your upland plants. Black eyed Susan. This wildflower grows a rosette of leaves the first year and flowers the second year. The coarse hairy stem terminates in a cheery daisy-like flower of golden yellow petals and a dark brown cone center. Several stems emerge from a taproot and although very short-lived, the plant sows lots of seeds and comes back reliably from seed in open soil. Prefers full sun to partial shade and medium soil moisture. However, plants can tolerate heat, drought, controlled burns, sand, and clay. The blossoms attract native bees, pollinating flies, beneficial wasps, and butterflies. Caterpillars of this silvery checker spot butterflies eat the foliage and goldfinches feed on the seeds too. Joe Pieweed. This wildflower has multiples of whorled leaves along the sturdy stems making it rather attractive even without flowers. The plant likes partial shade to full shade and moist soils, although it can adapt to bouts of drought with its deep roots. Midsummer, the plant blooms with large round heads of vanilla scented rosy pink flowers. The fragrant flowers draw in butterflies, skippers, moths, and native bees. Several species of moth caterpillars feed on the leaves. The blossoms turn to soft, pale, feathery seed clusters that are beautiful and persistent into the winter. 
Riddell's goldenrod. Stout stems and long narrow leaves, this goldenrod species has bright showy plumes of yellow flowers that bloom August through October. A well-behaved goldenrod does not take over an area and it grows well in full sun and wet to medium wet soil moisture. Blamed for fall allergies, it is actually ragweed which blooms at the same time that causes hay fever. Flowers provide nectar for butterflies and other nectar-seeking insects, and birds use the seeds into winter. Wild bergamot. With strong, square stems, this wildflower expands to create upright clumps of plants. The green leaves are very aromatic, and several species of caterpillars feed on them, while the aromatics deter mammal herbivores. In summer, the plants open up showy, rounded pom-poms of fragrant lavender tubular flowers. Pollinators flock to these flowers. Long-tongued bees, butterflies, skippers, hummingbird moths, and hummingbirds love the nectar. The blooming lasts about six weeks. Plants tolerate part sun and clay, but thrive in full sun and in moist, fertile soil. This flower is also commonly called bee balm. Swamp milkweed. These wildflowers thrive in full or partial sun and wet to medium dry soil moisture. They have slender willow-like leaves with sweet cinnamon vanilla scented clusters of many tiny rose pink star-shaped florets. These flowers draw flocks of bumblebees, honeybees, hummingbirds, hummingbird moths, and a plethora of butterflies, including monarchs, red admiral, American lady, painted lady, swallowtail, fritillary, and hair streaked butterflies. Once the seed pods split, they release a brown seed with a fluffy parachute that carries the seed on the wind. Low bush blueberry. Like the Michigan holly, this plant is also very versatile and can be grown in any sun condition in soil moisture from wet to dry. This low shrub has multiple twiggy branches with glossy leaves that change from red green in spring to dark blue green in summer and then maroon purple come fall. The shrub can spread by rhizomes and colonize open areas even in low quality habitat, making it great for preventing erosion where other plants might not be as happy to make a home. The small white, pink, Shaded bell-shaped flowers are followed by delicious edible blueberries. The berries are relished by more than just humans as wildlife from birds to bears enjoy the fruits. High bush cranberry, a shrub that can reach heights of 16 feet. The deciduous maple-like foliage is colorful in fall and the dense branches create a round outline making it attractive before and after flowers and fruit are present. This shrub prefers partial shade and wet to medium soil moisture conditions. The white flat topped flower clusters become distinctive orange red berries that often remain on the shrub into the winter. Many animals enjoy the berries in the fall, including humans. Along with food, this shrub provides excellent cover for small mammals and birds. In the upland zone, plants usually thrive in medium to dry conditions and can even handle some bouts of drought because as native plants, they have well-developed root systems that reach deep into the earth. This makes them great partners in preventing erosion. New England aster. Large and showy, this aster can grow to six feet tall. Sturdy, stiff, hairy stems support gray-green leaves. These plants grow best in an area with a little shade, but can tolerate full sun as long as there is a medium amount of soil moisture. August to October, these asters put out many bright, showy rose lavender purple flowers with yellow orange centers at the tips of the leafy branches. The late season flowers are a choice nectar source for migrating monarch butterflies, and the blooms are also frequented by bees, skippers, and other butterflies with many species of moth caterpillars eating the leaves. Butterfly weed. Bright scarlet orange flat topped flower clusters of many small star-shaped florets that bloom June to August. 
These flowers are prized for their brilliant color and ability to attract many butterflies, including monarchs. But as a repeat bloomer, they provide for many butterflies, moths, bees, and hummingbirds throughout the summer. The plants grow in full or partial sun and dry soils. They even tolerate drought well. Before and after flowers, the plant still has interesting foliage of many small dark green leaves along the stem. The seed pods split to release brown seeds with white tuft parachutes to carry them away in the wind. This seeds can easily be collected to grow into more plants. Wild Columbine. Spring emerging wildflower on slender stalks with fern-like foliage. This plant blooms elegant, nodding red and yellow flowers, which prevent small bees or sharp-tongued insects from sipping the nectar. However, long-tongued insects, hawk moths, and ruby-throated hummingbirds are perfectly adapted to this flower. It's host to the columbine dusky wing caterpillar. This plant thrives in partial shade, but can adapt to full sun or full shade as well. It can tolerate drought, but likes at least medium to medium dry soil moisture. Indian grass. Spring to early summer, this elegant clump forming grass grows low tufts of bluish green arching leaves. In later summer, stems extend and are topped with golden copper seed heads that glimmer in late afternoon sunlight. Full sun to partial shade, this grass is excellent at erosion control and thrives in sites of medium to dry soil moisture. This grass tolerates clay, sand, or gravel soils, and can tolerate drought or seasonal flooding. Plants provide pollen for bees and seeds for numerous songbirds and mammal species. It's also a host plant for the pepper and salt skipper caterpillars. Switchgrass, a very tall grass reaching six feet. It grows as a robust bunch grass that provides many vertical stems from short rhizomes. Preferring full sun in medium to dry soil moisture, it can tolerate clay, drought, and seasonal flooding. Medium green leaves in summer tend to amber color in fall and winter. The curly leaves and large plumes with small seeds persist into winter, giving birds a winter food source and cover. The seed is also eaten by small mammals and the plant is host to caterpillars of several skipper species. The Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership has wonderful lists of plants on their website for each of the four zones of a shoreline property. Let's head on over to the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership website so we can show you where to find these expanded plant lists. We will visit mishorelinepartnership.org backslash plants dash four dash inland dash lakes. When we get to the first page, scroll down to the set of pictures with labels below with locations of plants in relation to the water level. Here we go. We'll click on the label below the first plants and we're taken to a new page. On this page, you can scroll down to the chart. This chart has forbs, grasses, sedges, rushes, then trees and shrubs. You'll see that here along the edge. You can see a common name for the plants along with some specifics on their height, bloom time, and sun preferences. If you click on the scientific name, then you can go to a more in-depth page with a picture of that plant. This opens in a new tab, so you can just click back to the original tab to be able to get to the main list. From this same page, you can go back up and you can click on any of these links to plant lists for other zones. Each will have plants that should be at home in that area. You just click on it and you can scroll back down and this will show you more plants. Now let's go to some other resources for selecting native plants. Let's visit berryconservationdistrict.org. 
you can just go to barrycd.org. Once here, we can navigate through the menu through education to native plants and then resources for native plantings. This page contains convenient lists of native plant nurseries, native seed suppliers, and even contractors who can help make all your native plant dreams come true. To help with plant selection, I'm going to show you one of the databases that is included through one of the links for a place to buy plants. So we're going to go to wild type. We're going to go down to their retail catalog. And this is a native plant nursery south of Lansing in Mason. They have a lot of plants. You can see the scientific and then the common names here. This is going to include information about what time the flowers bloom, what color they are, what their sun requirements are, and their moisture requirements. With seven pages, this is a lot of information. It's a lot of plants to look through, but based on what we know from the presentation and what the water preferences are of plants, you can pick out those that will be happy in each zone of your property. And you can even get those plants from wild type if you like. Check out some of the other guides that we link to on the Berry Conservation District Native Plantings resource page. There's some really good ones on there. On behalf of Berry Conservation District, we thank you for doing your part in choosing native plants. If you have any questions, reach out to us on our Facebook page, Berry Conservation District Hastings. Visit our website at berrycd.org or feel free to give us a call. Thank you.